there's an imagination of Bengal being an enlightened state. Maybe party offices, you see the pictures of Karl Marx and Hegel and dust capitals and, uh, and, and a lot of big jargons. But if you talk to the, even to the uh, members of CPM party members, I'm sure many of them will not even able to tell us what is dust capital. <laughs> Was what happened in Sandesh Khali just an incident? Or does it tell us something structural about the way politics and economy function in West Bengal? Is Sheikh Shah Jahan, the TMC strongman who has been accused of committing some unimaginable crimes on the people of Sandesh Khali, just a random politician come criminal? Or does he tell us something more structural about the political economy of the state? Is his Muslim identity in any way related to the crimes he perpetrated? As the election season heats up, me and my colleague Manisha Mandal have travelled across some parts of West Bengal to find answers to these questions. In academic literature, Bengal has often been termed as a party society, a phrase coined by JNU professor Dwaipan Bhattacharya. Very simply, this means that in Bengal, every facet of cultural, social and economic life is governed not by caste or religion, but by political parties. The structures of power based on non-party forms of identity, caste especially, but also to some extent religion and language that you find in other, other parts, many other parts of India as institutions which mobilize people both for internal dispute resolution as well as broader political participation. Those kinds of institutions, as I said, for various diverse historical reasons have been uh, relatively weak in, in West Bengal, at least from the late 60s, early 70s onwards. So, the political parties have moved into that particular vacuum. And second, I think the post-land reforms, the traditional rural elites whose power stemmed from their control over land and who were also typically upper caste, they lost their most of their power. And that also created a vacuum in which the local party organizers, the party leaders stepped in. For this, you have to go back to the period of the left in 1977 when it came into power and they, they uh, began a series of very elaborate and far-reaching land reforms in 1977 called, Urban, uh, called Operation Barnka. And what happened at that time was that the implementation of Operation Barga, the actual operations whereby pe the farmers, the peasants were actually given the pattas, that was managed through the party organization. And that established the primary role of the party organization. And what is, what is also significant is that the panchayat system in West Bengal actually predated most of the other panchayats which were set up in the rest of the country under Rajiv, during Rajiv Gandhi's time. So Bengal, the panchayat system began in 1970s and began as an intensely political issue. So it was that which is continuing, that system, whereby the party played an important role, uh, the central role in village society which continued under the Trinamool. The people may have changed, but the structures, the, the flags may have changed, but the entire structure has more or less remained the thing. In 1965, when Singapore became an independent nation, its founding prime minister had reportedly said that he wanted Singapore to look like Calcutta. Indeed, Calcutta was not just the political capital of British India until 1911. Until many decades later, it was also the financial capital of India. The state's trade volumes, for instance, were much higher than Bombay, for most part until the mid-20th century. The Bank of Bengal was much larger than the Bank of Bombay for most part, and almost 50% of Indian companies were floated in Bengal until the 20th century. 
Yet, the economy of one of the most industrialized states in India had been crumbling from within, much before the left came to power. It's unfortunate that a state which was number one in the country, and the argument was whether Maharashtra is number one or Bengal is number one, that we were fighting for who's one and who's two. It's unfortunate that the state is still fighting that battle, except we are fighting, are we the last or the second last in the country? For the first 25 years, the two governments were the same, center and state were the same, Congress government. Congress government had a formal policy, a announced policy that to bring up the West, they'll put down the left. By that I mean the freight equalization. So everything of the natural advantage of East would be available to the West at the same. Not a single product would come the other way at the same cost. So this was the national policy. Moving fast forwarding. Then came 34 years of CPM led left rule. CPM left led left rule first concentrated only on land reform. And then when they went to industry, but the fact is that the hardcore of CPM was anti-industry. In 2011, the left's 34-year-old uninterrupted rule in Bengal came to a halt as Mamta Banerjee stormed to power as she opposed the entry of Tata, which was to be given almost 1,000 acres to set up a plant to manufacture the nano in Singur, and also the acquisition for a special economic zone in Nandikra. As most commentators said to us, from the start, she was more left of the left. Yet, between the left and the TMC, there is both continuity and difference. There is continuity in the sense that it's still a party society. The local party, party notables have an inordinate amount of influence, at least in the rural areas. So in that sense, there is continuity. There is difference a significant difference in many ways but I think one of the most important ways is the nature of these local party notables. Under the left the party notables, the local party bosses used to be typically school teachers, some college teachers, maybe some of them used to be lower level bureaucrats, clerks, government officers, some small peasants, whereas there is a disproportionate, almost overwhelming presence of the rural neo-rich business people in the TMC local party hierarchy. Most of the TMC local party on shows are, have their pies in various kinds of business and they are the local neo-rich people. Second, it's not as if local neo-rich elements were completely out of the left party structure, at least certainly not uh, towards the end of the left period. But there is a di the extent to which these elements have been using their political power to essentially steal money, whether through from extortion or from, from, um, from their cut money from government projects. That is quite unprecedented. Now it seems that to a great extent, the local ruling party machinery itself has become captured, completely captured by these local notables to the extent that the two are inseparable. In the absence of industrial growth, the economy of Bengal, even under the left, was completely controlled by the party. But under the TMC rule, this control has reached unprecedented. Most people privately told us that under this regime, it is impossible to get even a house renovated without giving cut money to the local TMC leader. In fact, Prime Minister Narendra Modi earlier this month talked about this culture, which is colloquially referred to in Bengal as Tola Bazi. TMC's Tola Bazi politics decides everything. Their leaders want to cut in everything. In Bengal, about 25 lakh fake job cards were created in Mandrega scheme. Even those who are yet to be born have job cards in their name. 
TMC Stola Bazaar leaders looted people's money. He said. It manifests itself in different ways. At the most benign level, it manifests itself in the numerous pujas which happen in Bengal, the control of the clubs, etc. And that's the most um, non-contentious part, probably. But after that, what uh, the the system here, which is called tola baji, in urban uh, society, which is why it's a form of extortion, whereby any activity you do. Requires a price, a political price, which you must pay to either the local councillor, the local club, the local goon, or whoever controls this. So, and that is one of the one of the main reasons why uh, investment in Bengal is virtually at a standstill. Because, of course, Bengal doesn't have a very strong what you call uh, industrialization. We have did not witness massive industrialization. Largely, the economy is agrarian economy, and the last two and three decades now shifting to a medium scale and small scale industries and the booming of real estate and other sectors. So, therefore, the employment opportunity in Bengal is very poor, and that's why. The very limited scarcity of resources and huge density of populations, skilled labour in Bengal, and they are all migrating to other Indian state. But here, in the case of Bengal, those who are here, there are huge competitions as far as uh, controlling resources are concerned. That's why, uh, for political party or the ruling party or opposition party, whoever, for political party. Controlling panchayati raj institutions, control, controlling local government is very important as far as the controlling the local resources. Therefore, that's why panchayat elections become so deadly violent in Bengal. Bengal is notorious for having one of the most violent elections, especially the panchayat elections in all of India. Even last year, panchayat elections held in the state witnessed widespread violence across several districts, leaving more than 40 people dead in both inter and intra party clashes. The reason why elections in Bengal are so deadly is closely linked to the control of resources and money, something that has only gained in importance under the TMC regime. So, on the bottom of all these things is money. I mean. If you look at the region of South 24, North 24, Bagana, Sundarskal is in kind of the border. And it's like full of water bodies, and it's known for fisheries and shrimp cultivation, and that's like big money involved. Mostly the shrimp market exports and all. So people like Shah Jahan, they know that if they can control these places, and then then there are various ways to control it. You can poison someone who is not listening to you. Someone is not parting with his. Share of the trade or something, the, the, there's this history and the culture of putting a poison oil in the ponds. It's called folidol, and this is how they kill the business of competitors or people who are not with them. And once you get the control or a major share of this place and of the ponds and all, it's like a multi-crore business. And once you, I mean, once you are probably the Richest person in that region because of this, then you can easily become the Robin Hood or the local Masia, or then you are very close to the political party in power. You usually share a part of it with the party in power or the local party, and then the administration is in your pocket. So it becomes like a criminal capital nexus. That's, I mean, being operational in those regions. With the BJP trying to consolidate its position in the state, the decades-old institutionalized corruption and criminalization of Bengal's politics is being infused with a Hindu-Muslim angle. Sandesh Khalib and this rural Bengal is largely socially concentrated by the socially oppressed communities like Dalits, Adivasis, and Muslims, and also uh, it's a it is a both. Uh, socially op three social oppressed communities. Also, there are internal contestations. So therefore, uh, it is easy to maneuver or easy to, you know, do politics based on these three identities. That's why BJP is uh, saying that uh, tribal women and Adivasis or Dalits are being oppressed by Sajan Singh. And when you say Sajan Singh, you know who is he signaling to? So on the other hand, it's not only Sajan Singh. It's not a communal phenomena. It's a phenomena of political economy phenomena. And that issue is being coloured in a very religious way. And that has, of course. 
political dividends. Like it's also easy to consolidate votes. This is Sanya Dhingra with my colleague Manisha Mondal reporting for the print.